Elges is a very tight knit small community and to experience three and four, five murders in a span of 48 hours is unheard of. Police are also investigating a murder in Algiers. Just before eight, an officer on patrol heard shots. Also breaking news at six, a man is dead from a deadly shooting in Algiers. The year is 1997, January to be exact, two weeks after New Year's Day. At around 4 a.m., Charles Watkins, a homicide detective with the New Orleans Police Department, was driving slow circles around the West Bank downriver from Algiers Point. Within minutes, a call comes in from dispatch reporting there's been a shooting at Live Oaks. Live Oaks, which most people still know by its former name, Digal Manor, was one of the roughest areas in old Algiers. Apartments that had been neglected over the decades. The buildings were in poor shape inside and out. From a distance, you could hardly see the complex through the trees. It was a neighborhood within a neighborhood Residents of an Algiers complex of condominiums and apartments say conditions have become so bad, some are afraid to walk through their complex. After months of begging for help to clean up the crumbling complex, they turn to action reporter Bill Capo. Contrary to popular belief, the West Bank wasn't the soft, quiet area that most on the East Bank thought it was. Violent, senseless crimes ran rampant on the West Bank as well. A couple of years prior, two young girls fell victim to a heinous act that would take their lives. Good evening, everyone. A bizarre murder case in Jefferson Parish took another strange twist today. A New Orleans man is in custody accused of killing his girlfriend's two young daughters, then burying their bodies beneath a highway overpass. Reporter Mike Ross has the latest. The gruesome discovery left investigators with a mystery, whose remains were buried under the Clearview overpass of the Earhart Expressway. Officials are now convinced the victims are 15-year-old Quian Johnson, and her 11-year-old sister, Melissa, who vanished 18 months ago. I was just wondering, but I was hoping that it wouldn't be them, you know. I just don't know. I don't know. Sheriff Lee now says the suspected killer is the boyfriend of the girl's mother. He is identified by police as 42-year-old George Preston Labrie. The sheriff says he has not confessed, but he has acknowledged the seriousness of the charges against him. He also intimated that... Uh, uh, what, the, what the other inmates in Angola would do to him if, if he was sent up for, for this particular charge. The clues added up last week about the identities of the victims. The tennis shoes found at the burial site were the same brand the girls wore. And a pair of gym shorts found with the remains were tracked back to Samuel Green Middle School. Quianne Johnson was a student there before she disappeared. Investigators say a major breakthrough took place in the case as they questioned a large number of people in the girls' neighborhood. Suspicion turned to George Labrie. And we've had two separate witnesses that have said that within the last year, Labrie had told them that he had killed the two girls and buried them under an overpass. Witnesses also say the two girls were seen leaving their apartment with Labrie on the night they disappeared. Why, if, if he did it, why would he, why would he want to take and kill them? I, I, I just don't know. Oh, Jesus, I know Investigators say Labrie has a criminal history. He tried to escape from Angola, but was caught. In 1991, he was arrested. Sheriff Lee says the charges were dropped because Labrie threatened the victim and her mother, and they refused to testify. Investigators say they now know who the victims are in the overpass murders and who the alleged killer is. What they don't know yet is why this tragedy happened. I'm Mike Ross, Eyewitness News, Nightwatch. Now, investigators say the girl's mother is not a suspect in any of the wrongdoings in this case. Let's get back to the uh, Upon pulling into the driveway on Mill Street, Officer Watkins would find two other officers already on the scene. The two officers were standing over a young woman who sat on the steps outside her front door with her head in her hand. The other officers on the scene had already taken her name. It was Lakeisha. 
of the residents, roused by the commotion, peeked out of their curtains and leaned over the railing to get a better look. At that point, Officer Watkins got out of his car and walked over to Lakeisha's boyfriend, who lay on the sidewalk covered in his own blood. Lakeisha's boyfriend was none other than Robert Johnson Jr., a.k.a. Kilo G. When Cash Money Records started several years before, my brothers Brian Williams, a.k.a. Baby, and Ronald Williams, a.k.a. Sugar Slim, Kilo T had been their flagship artist. Robert was only 14 when he met Baby and Slim. Too young to sign a contract, he had to take a ferry across the river to find his grandmother so she could sign in his place. Before Manny Fresh, before BG, before the fleet of Bentleys and other luxury cars that roamed the streets of New Orleans, there was Kilo G and Ronald Smith, aka Big Road. Big Road met Baby in 1992 through his partner who worked the counter at Peaches Records on Jim Tilly Boulevard. Road was home from Houston where he had been working with the Ghetto Boys and had never heard of Cash Money Records. Road, who lived downtown, wasn't familiar with Baby, who lived uptown. Baby loved the Ghetto Boys, so it made perfect sense. Along with his partner, Big Diaz, Rogue would go on to produce Cash Money's first record, Hilo G's The Sleepwalker. They sold the copies out of the trunk of Baby's car. The album wasn't a great success. Baby and Slim were both disappointed, but had a notion of what they had done wrong. Bounce music was taking off in New Orleans at the time. It was a no-brainer. Sleepwalker was too gutter, too raw. Ciamara was too underground and didn't realize it. Sleepwalker was too hard compared to music coming out of the city at the time, but it was a dope album. Yeah, motherfuckers, you're about to witness the birth of a dead man. Whoa. You're fixing us to be entertained by a sleepwalker, Whoa. a soul snatcher, pussy beat motherfucker named Shit. Kilo G. With songs such as Psychopathic Killer and Kill His Family, the album was a far stretch from bounce music. When asked, people that knew Kilo said although his music was gritty and grimy, he was somewhat of a quiet dude who kept to himself and never got into trouble. At least they had never saw him get into any trouble. It was this that made it hard to believe that he had been shot. When the police arrived, Kilo was still alive, but you couldn't tell it. He was bleeding from his mouth and from his nose. The cops knelt down beside him and asked who had shot him, but he was unable to respond. The paramedics arrived and helped the then 20-year-old Kilo G into the back of an ambulance. The cops would then continue to process the crime scene, photographing the site from different angles, noting the blood stains on Kilo's blue Cadillac. The police report read, and I quote, Detective Watkins questioned Lakeisha. Lakeisha stated that she was sleeping in the bedroom when she heard two gunshots. She jumped up and ran to the front door. She noticed that the door was wide open. She looked out and noticed the victim standing on the sidewalk, holding his chest. He was yelling, help me. According to Lakeisha, the victim told her not to come outside. They might kill her. Lakeisha did not know who he was referring to when he made the reference they. In an unfortunate turn of events, Kilo G died in the ambulance on his way to the hospital. After a few months, the murder investigation stalled. The police who were working the case almost immediately within days had a tip of a possible suspect that quite possibly could have been gang related. The suspect was said to be a person of interest in another recent murder at Live Oaks.
sources told the police that he lived with a girlfriend, suggesting that if the police were to talk to her alone, she might confirm his involvement. She never did. The leads dried up and the case went cold. Blocked everything off, and this guy ran the blockade last night, brought it in and burned it. Residents in an Algiers neighborhood say an abandoned housing complex is attracting criminals. Just last night, someone dumped off a truck and set it on fire, and that's not the first time it's happened. Tonight, a nonprofit group is pushing a plan to fix the problem. This is all happening at the former De Gaulle Manor apartment complex in Algiers. WDSU news reporter Blake Hansen has the story all new for you at 6. Yeah, you can't help but see it. As Algiers resident Terry Usin walks home, he walks past a graveyard of six burned out cars. It looked bad, deplorable. Well, not deplorable. Close to it. The latest addition is this truck that burned up overnight. Residents say since the housing complex closed a couple years back, it's become a dumping ground for criminals trying to ditch evidence and steal metal. I can't thank for the criminals, but I hope they stop it. In order for the truck to get onto the property, you had to push past this other burned out car at the main gate. A nonprofit put this car here in order to prevent people from getting in. And that's not the only thing that nonprofit is doing to try and fix this place up. That's been an issue for the past year. Bill Thomas is part of the nonprofit RDLN Foundation. It started the process of buying the blighted property last year. And in the past couple of weeks, it started to revamp the area into a 15 acre sporting complex and resort. This is kind of like their hobby or art. Thomason says they'll maintain some of the graffiti that's popped up at the site and also look to locals to help with the cleanup and construction process. It's just something that's really needed over here because, you know, it's a real low income area. There's it's high unemployment and, you know, you get this big dilapidated site. The foundation is now seeking funding and permits and hoping to turn a dumping ground into a source of strength in the community. Pretty soon it'll all be cleaned up and hopefully people get the message, you know, these guys are fixing this to do something good, so stay out of here. In Algiers, Blake Hansen, WDSU News. The nonprofit says it's applied for tax credits and is also getting a donation from a movie that will be using the site for film. Norman, investigators are still trying to piece together exactly what happened out here in the 1900 block of El Azardi in Algiers. What we do know at this time is just about 7.15 tonight. Police tell us that gunfire rang out. Police also tell us that four people were shot in this incident. Two people, police are reporting, have life-threatening injuries. The other two have non-life-threatening injuries. Now, we are told the victims are all males. They range in age from 20 to 23 years old. When the shooting started, we should mention that the victims all scattered. One person had a gunshot wound to the back and to the back to the back and to the back of his leg. He was found just about a block away from here on Merle. Two of the other victims, we should mention, got in a car and were transported to the hospital by uh, a private conveyance, if you will. But they were stopped by Crescent City Connection Police uh, at that time. 
at that time, the ambulance has actually met the two victims on the bridge, and they were taken to the hospital as well. The fourth victim in the shooting was actually taken to the hospital from the scene. Now, police have not given us any indication as to whether or not there is a shooter on the loose. Neighbors describe the scene as an exchange of gunfire between all the people that were involved. That uh, has not been confirmed at this time. Those are just eyewitness accounts. We should also mention that police say there were about three dozen shell casings on the ground, so a lot of gunfire was uh, exchanged in this incident. That's the story for now. We're on your side. I'm Gina Swanson for WDSU News.